television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. Today's big picture is concerned with United States military assistance advisory groups in four countries which lie in or near the Middle East. Not the least of the mysteries surrounding the exotic Middle East is the fact that nobody's sure exactly where it is. There are no exact boundaries. But the area we call Middle East lies somewhere between India and the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea, between the Caspian Sea and the Arabian Sea between Africa's Sahara Desert and the Rocky Mountains of southern Turkey. On the African periphery of the Middle East, across the Red Sea from Saudi Arabia, is the ancient land of Ethiopia. Capital city of Ethiopia is the sprawling city of Addis Ababa. Here in this city, on the eve of World War II, the Italian governor of fascist Italy caused the massacre of 30,000 Ethiopian patriots in a vain attempt to end their resistance to foreign conquest. But this ancient African empire, the oldest independent native state in Africa, was never to abandon her tradition of fierce independence. Today she stands free as before, and over a land from which her invaders have long since departed in final defeat, the flag of Ethiopia still proudly flies. As they prepare to celebrate their annual Armed Forces Day, the leaders and picturesquely uniformed warriors of this small nation can look back on a tradition of valor and independence which was old when Columbus set sail for the New World. In Ethiopia, as in most of this part of the world, old and new are in sharp contrast. As the emperor of the Ethiopians passes beneath the triumphal arch en route to Haile Selassie Stadium, his ornate ceremonial coach and the leopard skins of his honor guard are in vivid contrast to the mechanized equipment and planes of an increasingly modern Ethiopian armed force. Old and new, each in their several ways, the people of Addis Ababa greet the arrival of their monarch. National colors are dipped in salute as the emperor takes his place in the reviewing stand. His Imperial Majesty, Haile Selassie, Emperor of Ethiopia. The slow march, a drill field exercise which looks much simpler than it is, requiring great precision and marching skill. Mules play an important part in the defense of a mountainous, forested country such as this. Here they pass in review, drawing modern light artillery, furnished under the Mutual Defense Assistance Program. Watching his troops and their modern equipment, the emperor might well reflect on how different might have been the outcome had these men been so equipped when the invaders came in October 1935. Never again will men with primitive spears attempt to defend their homeland against a modern mechanized army. To their courage and valor have now been added through the mutual security program the arms of modern war. Today, if compelled, they might hope to mount an effective defense. The Minister of Defense looks on while the Imperial bodyguard demonstrates some crack cavalry exercises. Horse cavalry is rapidly vanishing from Western armies. Here in Africa, it still has its uses. <laughs> 
develops highly skilled horsemen. Incorporated in this year's Armed Forces Day is the first annual sports day, giving Ethiopian athletes a chance to demonstrate their prowess before the royal family. Behind these demonstrations of Ethiopia's steadily growing military modernization lies the hard day-to-day -day work of such men as Sergeant First Class George T. Monahan of the U.S. Military Assistance Advisory Group. The Military Assistance Advisory Group in each country receiving military aid works out the program for items to be supplied to that country. Here, United States Sergeant Charles Scrivener joins an Ethiopian officer in checking engines of newly arrived American jeeps. MAG representatives also assist in military training programs, helping provide the skills needed to handle modern weapons. An artillery class of the Ethiopian field artillery is assisted by a MAG soldier instructor. Artillery is perhaps the greatest departure from the traditional weapons of these native warriors. A rifle is, in a sense, only a more efficient bow and arrow. The artillery gunner, however, must learn techniques which enable him to fire on targets he never actually sees. The natural aptitudes of the born warrior are of little use here. The artilleryman must learn scientific skills without which the best weapon made will never strike its target. The bazooka, technically speaking, a 3.5 rocket launcher, is another modern weapon of war, which had yet to be invented when the troops of Imperial Ethiopia were last compelled to defend their homeland against invaders from beyond the sea. In the right hands, this simple device enables a two-man team to destroy armored vehicles, which were once thought to be impervious even to artillery fire. Assisted by an Ethiopian translator, United States Sergeant Chester F. Centeni explains the recoilless rifle. A somewhat different type of instruction is taking place in the American Community School of Addis Ababa. Children of Americans assigned to military assistance advisory groups lose nothing of the traditional American school program not even sandlot baseball. Ringing the school bell is Mrs. William Davis, whose husband directs the U.S. agricultural program in Ethiopia. Teachers in the American Community School are frequently wives of Americans assigned to the mission. Behind these gates is an institution which American kids have elected Ethiopia's number one attraction, the Royal Lion Enclosure. Representing what is probably the largest collection of lions in captivity, the royal enclosure is a far cry from the local zoo. One thing you don't ordinarily get in the zoo at home is an opportunity to actually pet the lions. To the Ethiopian, the lion is a symbol of historic import, comparable to our own bald eagle, denoting strength pride and greatness of heart. Their royal lion is a model to be followed as this once primitive people moves forward on the road to full membership in the community of modern nations. The Middle East links three continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe. North of Ethiopia, nearer to Europe, is Iraq occupying the very heart of the Middle Eastern area. Capital of Iraq is the fabulous city of Baghdad. The old city of Baghdad was for 500 years the center of the Arab world. King Faisal I, who succumbed to an early death in 1933, has since been succeeded by Faisal II, who became monarch while still a small child. There is no question of the devotion in which this young ruler is held by his subjects. One reason for the Iraqis' affection for their young monarch is perhaps the intense effort 
he and his governors have made to increase the use of land in their country. It is a paradox that in the teeming, congested lands of the Middle East, more than one half of the potentially usable farmland has lain for centuries uncultivated. Irrigation projects such as this may provide living space for many millions of people. Iraq is a Muslim state. Her cities dotted with the typical mosques and minarets of the followers of Mohammed, standing side by side with modern office buildings witnessing the rapid passage of 20th century automobiles imported from virtually every nation of the world. Somewhat less miraculous than Baghdad's legendary flying carpets, they are also more reliable and easier to find. One of the most advanced of Middle Eastern cities, Baghdad has recently acquired the nucleus of a television network. This is her first fully equipped station. A good many of Iraq's television programs are films imported from the United States. The moving line on this TV screen, incidentally, is a result of a trick played by the motion picture camera, and not the fault of Iraq's first-rate television engineers. Iraq's climate resembles that of the American Southwest. Members of the American colony find a swimming pool in Baghdad as welcome as one in our own Arizona desert. United States wives are quick to agree that to those who love to shop, there is nothing quite equal to Middle East bazaar. Selling in a bazaar is more than a science, more than an art. It is a way of life. The merchant of the bazaar is a psychologist who knows how to play on the complicated instrument of human hopes and desires, who makes the act of buying a source of unique diversion and pleasure. Pleasure and diversion are not, however, the reason these Americans are in Baghdad. Attached to the United States Military Assistance Advisory Group for Iraq, their chief business is to make sure that the Iraqis become increasingly able to defend their way of life against any potential aggressor. The high-ranking officers arriving for an inspection of Iraq's MAG headquarters come as representatives of a government which knows how often wars have begun with attacks by the strong on the weak. A military assistance advisory group works closely with the U.S. diplomatic mission to each country. It forms part of a team which is able to develop a well-rounded program of military and economic aid to enable a country to make its maximum contribution to mutual defense. of Iraq's Port of Basra comes a steady flow of supplies and equipment ordered by MAG headquarters. In the land of the two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, Basra has been for more than 10 centuries one of the strategic ports of the world. Today it carries military equipment to the troops and military academies of Iraq's army, where American specialists are on hand to instruct in their use. Major Robert Pyle, Ordnance Specialist on Iraq's MAG staff, puts a 40-millimeter anti-aircraft gun crew through its drill, while the Commandant of the Iraq Army School of Artillery looks on. The Iraqi Army shows many traces of its tutelage under the British. Uniforms and military tradition tend to follow the English example. Between the two world wars, Iraq's British friends contributed much to maintain Iraq as a strong and independent nation in the turbulent Middle East. Today, the United States contributes toward that same end and for the same reason. An Iraq able to defend herself can be a major bulwark of peace. There has been no moment in recorded history 
when the Middle East was without strategic importance to the major powers of the world. Of these nations, one of the most important is Iraq's neighbor to the east, the state of Iran. Modern Iran is the country that once was Persia, a vast land with a history far longer than that of any Western country. The great wars of ancient Greece and Rome were waged against the soldiers of ancient Persia. Iran today is a land of extremes, both natural and human. Contrast is an integral part of the scene in Iran. The city of Tehran first became known to most Americans as the site of the Big Three meeting in 1943. Within the decade since, the city has more than doubled its population. This metropolis, which houses today more than a million inhabitants, is in some ways modern, in others, very old. The official religion of Iran is Islam, but there are important differences between Mohammedanism here and in Iran's Muslim neighbors. For long before the people of Iran were Muslims, they were Persian, and this national character is reflected in all of their institutions, perhaps nowhere so much as in the Gulistan Palace and the Royal Museum of Tehran. The splendor of its tile and gold leaf mosaics, its priceless Persian carpets are graphic reminders of Persia's former greatness, when the wealth of half the civilized world flowed to the treasuries of Persia's king. As strategic importance undiminished, Iran is one of some 35 friendly nations to receive U.S. military aid since World War II. From the general staff level down to troops in the field, Iranian army personnel are also given the benefit of the training and experience of U.S. military experts, serving as specialists on the staff of the Military Assistance Advisory Group. This instruction is extremely varied, involving not only the tactical employment of heavy equipment, but the introduction of American pistols, carbines, and other small arms to high-ranking Iranian officers. War dogs have a role in most modern armies. As sentinels for certain types of guard duty, they are without fear. In the barren, stony, and often desert wastes of Iran, these fleet, four-footed warriors are particularly valuable, often able to endure hardships or surmount obstacles which are beyond the capacities of their two-footed masters. At the other extreme is this radio technician's course, where a civilian translator assists in briefing his countrymen on the use of an American tank radio. In the armored school, an Iranian officer briefs his men on the use of an item of United States armored equipment using a specially constructed model. A session of dismounted drill. Here the Iranians tend to follow the British example. When it comes to mounted drill, the Iranians follow no one's example. Persian horsemen have long been famed in song and legend. The Iranians are a sports conscious people. Here, some of the country's top athletes pass and review before Shah Mohammad Reza, Iran's king. <laughs> the 
Iran is not, unfortunately, a healthy country. The eradication of its many endemic diseases is a major goal of the Iranian government and her foreign allies. Meanwhile, the health of American dependents is ensured by the United States Army Hospital in Tehran. Americans import many of their favorite recreations, the inevitable swimming pool, golf on the driest course in the world, and of course softball. United States military aid aims to keep Iran strong. The ripening friendships between individual Americans and Iranians are one of many factors, helping to keep Iran a friend of the United States. Moving east from Iran, we come to a nation that is at once very young and very old, Pakistan formerly a part of British India, is today a sovereign growing country, like its Indian neighbor, an important link between Europe to the west and Asia to the east. This young nation is one of the largest countries of the world. The portion of Pakistan which adjoins Iran is only a part of this new state. For many hundreds of miles to the east lies a second area that is also an integral part of the Pakistan Republic. Pakistan's capital city of Karachi boasts the largest airport in Asia and is one of Asia's most important seaports. Through this port have come many millions of dollars of United States military equipment. An independent state for scarcely 10 years, the Pakistans are determined to maintain that independence which for centuries remained little more than a dream. Since World War II, the United States has distributed some $11 billion in military aid to friendly nations in every part of the world. The purpose of that aid is to lend free nations the military strength necessary to maintain their freedom and independence. Americans think of themselves as a young nation. Yet in a sense, we are very old, for America has lived in the age of technology longer than any nation on Earth. From Brooklyn, USA, to Karachi, Pakistan, is a vast distance both in space and in time. By our efforts to span this distance, we assure a peaceful future for both this young nation and our own. A military assistance advisory group is the basic field organization through which our Department of Defense administers its share of America's mutual security programs. The responsibilities of each man are largely determined by the agreement between the United States and the host country. Generally, they will include determination of the country's military requirements and furnishing advice to facilitate proper utilization of the material received. The training of foreign military personnel is also a frequent contribution. Here, Major Joel A. Levenstein of the United States Army Signal Corps briefs a group of Pakistan Army enlisted men on the use of a new United States military radio set. The first military assistance advisory groups, as we know them today, were organized in Greece and Turkey in 1949. There were two such advisory missions in Pakistan's neighbor, Iran, by the year 1942. Today, there are MAG missions in 73 countries, and we are assisting with the training of over 200 military divisions throughout the world. Today, such missions have vastly increased duties, and they supervise and administer the deployment of the most advanced forms of military equipment to all parts of the globe. Often the specialists assigned to a MAG mission find themselves making tankers or jet pilots of men who grew up in a land where the always present camel was the most efficient means of transportation. The Middle East is extremely poor in most natural resources, but those it has are vital. The oil reserves of this area 
were estimated to include 60% of the world's total, almost twice as much as the oil-rich United States. Its location is strategic. The Suez Canal, like the Panama Canal, is a waterway of great importance. A dispute over this canal has recently convulsed most of the civilized world. Remote as it may once have seemed, the Middle East is in reality the crossroads of the world, linking Europe, Asia, and Africa. Air routes depend on refueling bases here, as would our strategic aircraft in time of war. Here stand 100 million people who cannot be allowed to pass under communist domination. These people occupy an area from whence sprang the three great religions of modern times. They are our people who, as the Lion of Judah warned us many years before the last war, must be allowed to retain their freedom if we are to keep our own. Strange, far off, and exotic as the Middle Eastern countries once seemed to us here in America, we have come to realize that their destiny and ours are tightly bound together. Ancient Greece, Rome, and the great powers of Europe all came to know that there could be no peace for them without peace in the Middle East. Today, we are doing everything in our power to keep the peace in that vital area. Now, this is Sergeant Stuart Queen inviting you to be with us again next week for another look at your army in action on the big picture. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the Army at home and overseas. Produced by the Army Pictorial Center. Presented by the United States Army in cooperation with this station.